on your 25th anniversary. Nice. Let's go, kids. Do you have people come? Oh. Yes. Oh, okay. you don't need to know. About what?
Where's the coaster? Come on, Joanne, get a picture. On to city manager's report of issues raised at prior council meetings. No, that's fine. Special event applications. Yeah, I don't disagree with you. Good evening, Mary Council. First application before you is the Cinco de Mayo Food Justice Fundraiser on May 5th. Next is the Five Alarm 5K race on June 11th. Third is the um, Youth Enriched to Serve annual beach cleanup on May 4th. Music concert series in Springwood Park, Music Mondays. The next application is for the Asbury Park 12 Hours of House Music Music Festival. I'm asking that this application be rejected because the applicant underestimated what the attendance would be. Next is the thanks for giving Turkey dash 5k. Haitian Heritage Month celebration on um, May 18th at the Senior Center. And the last application is the uh, new application for the Asbury Park 12 Hours of House Music. Um, there are two dates on the application. The request is that the first date be approved. The second date is Labor Day weekend. And because the attendance is expected to exceed 1,000, that just won't work on Labor Day weekend in Asbury Park. So the June 8th date, I'm requesting um, approval for that. Also, the applicant requests uh, four officers and two EMTs, and that's a minimum. That would need to be determined um, as we get closer to the event. That number could increase the number of city uh, officials he would need to hire. Any questions? No, just so everybody knows, an applicant can request anything, but the police <laughs> chief, the fire chief, and DPW says what's needed, and if they don't like the number, they go elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Felicia. Thank you. Next is items to be presented by Darlene Tyler regarding New Jersey Entry Corporation. Tyler is not here. Okay. Then we'll move on to items to be presented by the transportation planner, Michael Manzella. Just missed them. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, 
We're here tonight to talk to, about e-mobility in Asbury Park. Um, e-mobility is a hot topic in the world of transportation and has the promise of further uh, providing options for folks to get around and uh, potentially reduce parking demand too. So I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. Um, specifically, e-mobility refers to e-bikes and e-scooters, but tonight we're gonna mostly focus on e-scooters and their potential benefits. So, oh, there we go. Uh, does it take a second? Or it doesn't work. Oh, okay. Uh, so some of the benefits of e-scooters is the reduction of traffic congestion by shifting trips away from motor vehicles. Um, e-scooters have a pretty long range and are uh, fairly quick at, get, at moving people around. So um, cities that have started to introduce e-scooters have seen a reduction in parking demand. Um, e-scooters fit an uh, interesting use case. Uh, people who tend to use e-scooters are traveling distance that are a little bit too long to walk. Um, but maybe too short to take a Uber or Lyft or a taxi um, and maybe can't ride a bicycle. So it's kind of a unique niche that has really started to grow uh, as they've been introduced across the country. Um, the early benefits of e-scooter programs around the country have shown that expanded access to underserved residents and underserved areas, areas where there might not be public transit available. and um, and of course, reducing vehicle emissions and air pollution. These are electric, therefore they produce no emissions. And by shifting those private car trips to an e-device, you're reducing vehicle emissions. And it's pretty economic. The average trip is about $3 an hour, uh, or $3, sorry. And a lot of uh, the providers have come up with some low income options. Takes a second to change the slide. <laughs> Uh, so a little bit of the history of e-scooters. They really emerged only in 2017 as a new shared mobility service, but within a year they were all over the country and kind of operating um, without local consent. So companies would just go in, plop down hundreds, sometimes thousands of scooters, and it did, it did lead to a lot of issues. Um, oversaturation was one big one, so there was almost too many scooters for the city to handle and, and park properly. Uh, Riding on sidewalks oh, has been. Oh. I'll just keep talking. Riding on sidewalks has been an issue, um, and there has been a little bit of chaos when it comes to uh, providing parking for these for these scooters. But cities like Portland, Oregon, and just now announced last week, Hoboken, the first in New Jersey, who are going to be uh, launching. Uh, a scooter program have taken a proactive path. So um, there are vendors out there who are willing to wait for local consent before just plopping scooters down and working with the municipalities in making sure that the program is a success. And that's the route that we're considering here. Um, in New Jersey, the legislature just adopted S-731. It's a bill that was uh, adopted on March 14th, just less than a month ago. It amends Title 39 to regulate the operation of e-mobility devices included by e-bikes and e-scooters. Previously, they were technically illegal on city streets. Um, and it was passed with an overwhelming majority of senators and assemblymen. The governor has to take action on the bill by May 13th. Um, and what the bill does is allow the op allows the operation on streets and bike lanes of e-mobility devices. It caps their speed at speeds at 19 miles an hour. So they're low speed electronic dev electric devices. and the bill prohibits sidewalk riding not only for e-bikes and e-scooters, but even for bicycles across the state, um, unless the municipality uh, passes an ordinance to allow riding on sidewalks. Of course, in Asbury Park, we've already adopted an ordinance prohibiting bicycle riding on sidewalks, so the state law actually also prohibits it for e-scooters and e-bikes. So I talked about Portland, Oregon, and they conducted a pilot study um, for e-scooters, and actually measured the results of the pilot. If the slide ever comes up. Okay, well, I'll just talk about some of the results. So 62% of all Portlanders viewed e-scooters positively. Uh, Portlanders primarily use e-scooters for transportation, 71% instead of recreation, 29%. 
Thirty-four uh, percent of Portland riders took an e-scooter instead of driving a personal car or using Lyft or Uber. <laughs> so that shows that there is a significant mode shift when you introduce scooters away from cars and towards scooters. Um, e-scooter e users per said that they preferred riding on low-speed streets and in bike lanes as opposed to on the sidewalk. And 74%, this is a really interesting stat, 74% of local users reporting never riding bike share and 42% of all users never even bicycled. So like I said, it's kind of fitting a niche that uh, for folks who may not be interested in bicycling but may not want to use a car to get around. So in terms of the solutions that cities have started to come up with, especially around parking, um, some vendors are being proactive now, and a lot of cities are, in creating what are called virtual stations. So basically you designate an area on the sidewalk or <coughs> off, off street where there's enough room. You put markings, you put signage, you put bike racks if you want. And within the app, the e-scooters cannot be your, your session cannot be closed until you return a scooter to, to a location. They actually use geographic GIS systems to geofence um, where the stations are. So you actually can't end your trip if you're not in the location. So that kind of helps to corral the parking issue and where the cities, the early cities who launched these programs saw parking all over the sidewalks, um, pretty much everywhere, just chaos. But now cities are getting smart and, and really making these virtual stations. So what it means for us is that we can create virtual stations pretty much anywhere. Um, obviously, if we were to, to pursue this uh, e-scooter program, we would look to put it in the same places that we have the bike share currently. But we have the ability to hit all areas of the city. And in the future, as you know, more and more bike lanes become uh, available on our city streets when the Main Street project is done, those are areas where we can start to hit um, shared mobility where they currently aren't being served. So there's, there's real potential there. And as far as no riding on sidewalks, um, the vendors have really put a lot of emphasis on in the app, uh, making sure that users know the rules of the road, um, really stress that, that no sidewalk riding is allowed. And to that end, the city does plan on at some point installing uh, signs such as these um, on our major commercial corridor district sidewalks so that people are aware of the law that bike scooters and, and skateboards shouldn't be ridden on sidewalks. So with that, I have uh, with me Brad Erickson. He's from Zagster, our current bike share provider. Um, he's one of the sales directors and he's just going to talk about kind of Zagster's approach to how they handle scooters. Um, not to say that they, you know, have the contract right now for, for a potential scooter expansion, but at least talk about how they approach it since they are our current bike share vendor. Great. Thanks, Mike. Mayor, Council, um, thank you for having me here tonight. We are no strangers to Esray Park. We've been operating the uh, bike share since uh, 2017 here, the white Asbury Park branded bikes. I'm actually, uh, myself and the founder of our company are natives of Bergen County, and we founded our company in Philadelphia. So we're local to the region, but we have a national reach. We currently run 250 programs uh, throughout 40 states across the country and in Canada. What we started 11 years ago is the first turnkey bike share, so allowed small and mid-sized communities to get big city amenities like bike share uh, in a predictable, uh, commercially effective way. And now what we've shifted uh, into continuing to operate those bike share programs, but introducing other modes of transit alongside our operations. So we've done that as a reaction to what consumers want. We don't see pedal bikes going away. Mike talked you through a bunch of great stats about the popularity of e-mobility. Uh, what we see is that uh, bikes serve a really great purpose. There's a huge recreation and health focus. There's people that want to cycle. E-bikes allow um, you know, a similar concept, but uh, obviously with the concept of electric assist, so you can justify trips that are longer or replacing a car. And scooters sort of fit in between the two. And uh, what we're really seeing is when these three options are combined and, and set up to uh, accommodate future modes of, of vehicles, is that people become more interested in using the sum of all of these, right? It's easier to give up your car when you have the option to take an Uber on a Friday night, a scooter to work, a bike on the weekends. It's lot easier to um, to make that jump from single occupancy vehicle ownership 
So instead of going out and um, trying to compete with 20 different scooter manufacturers out there, we have partnered with, uh, with one of the best. They're a company called Spin that's a division of Ford Mobility. There's a huge focus on obviously manufacturing quality and safety that the Ford brand is known for. Uh, this is a look at the Spin uh, scooter and we partnered with them and combined it with our operations platform that we're currently using today in the city. So we have a single point of contact that Mike works with uh, between 2016 and 2017 we work together between our team and the city to identify locations for the bike share, pick out a, a pricing plan that worked for all stakeholders, the community, really have these community first mobility solutions. That's what makes us really unique in the industry. We're not coming in and trying to be a consumer only brand. We're one of the unique companies that are a B2B partnership where we're partnering with the city. So we've taken that same approach that's been successful with us for the past 12 years and now are introducing another mode of mobility that that is starting to be treated alongside a bike. You start to see a lot more regulation that looks at uh, low powered scooters and, and e-bikes, very similar to how we regulate um, pedal bikes today. Mike and I have talked about um, our micro mobility approach, and I think it really starts with the benefit of, of leveraging the work that we've done to date with the bike share by turning the bike share stations into, you know, now it's called micro mobility hubs where there's one point of contact for bikes and scooters. It's a predictable location where you can go and start and end your ride. Um, we have actual staff. We don't hire gig workers or bid out jobs. We, you know, right now we have full time. Uh, mechanics and operations staff here and uh, scooters would allow us to actually hire more. Um, so one big operational difference between scooters and bikes is that there's a battery component. So we actually go out and collect all the scooters, their GPS tracked, we collect them every night, take them back to a warehouse, charge them in a safe you know, environment and then put them back out you know, at an agreeable time, typically 7 a.m. Uh, the next morning at dedicated locations. So they become a way for you to rely on these areas where you can go pick up and end your bike and or scooter. There's not enough scooters, there's always a bike option. In 2020, as we're looking at this as a pilot, there may be an e-bike option as well. And we really see the value in the sum of all of those things being accessed together. Through the technology that SPIN has developed, we have the ability to, to geo-control so we can uh, create prohibited parking zones, notifications for riding and off-limits, create vir virtual stations, and actually regulate speeds. So if there's parts of the city that we want people that are riding to go slower or not ride at all, we have the ability to regulate those speeds and obviously, consistent with the law, make it a cap at a safe speed that's similar to what a pedal bike might go at. This is our general approach for uh, for Asbury Park. Obviously, nothing set in stone. We 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 uh, look to get your feedback, but the idea is to to leverage the same sort of staff that we have had success with the bike share. Create a local team that's based here. Have a warehouse. Have staff here. Combined with our headquarters in um, in Boston and Philadelphia, and really focus on a daily uh, operations and collection of scooters. That combined with a lot of rider education, right? there's a lot of tech features that we could talk about, industry can talk about, um, but at the end of the day, just like bikes, it comes down to rider education events, um, you know, exposing people to uh, different safety measures. And we can combine that with some AI and machine learnings that because we have all this data that we can collect about behaviors throughout our programs throughout the country, we can combine that with local, um, you know, local information and create something that, um, you know, is really customized for the local community. And we'll do that all in a transparent manner. So we'll, we'll provide you and Mike uh, access to web-based dashboards and, and uh, customized reports on all the things that uh, we're gonna commit to from an operational perspective. Yeah, so the next steps are really for us as a city to determine what the best approach is to go forward, whether that's a, a pilot or a straight RFP for, for a new service. Um, and depending on how quickly we move on it, we could have scooters here this summer for a pilot. Um, of course, this would be contingent on the governor actually signing the legislation on May 13th, on or before May 13th. Um, and we hope that that will happen. So any questions? I have, I have a couple of questions. I do too. How fast do they go? 19. That's the fastest they go. <laughs> yeah, so, the, so the, the state law caps all scooters to travel at 19 miles an hour. I will tell you that I have one personally. It never gets above 17. Uh, but, we can cap our scooters at 18. And we could regulate it to say, hypothetically, like 10 or 12, whatever, whatever sure. it is yes. that we chose to do. Yeah. And if I heard you right, we can regulate it 
at a certain speed on Ocean Ave and a different speed on, say, 4th Ave. Exactly. So uh, during the setup process, there's typically a time between some sort of agreement process and setup, just like the bike share. We'll identify those zones with you, load them in our partner's technology, um, and take that same capping approach to cap ski speeds in certain areas. Um, and um, if we were to do it, how many would we start with? Uh, initially, I mean, just talking with Zags, we're not saying, again, that they have the contract, but I think that they are looking to provide 25 to start. Depending on how the demand is, they can go grow quickly. And we talked about maybe up to 200. We probably wouldn't want to do more than that, at least for the first year. Um, just to see, we, it really depends on the demand. Right? And then if I followed that correctly, also you put them essentially where you put the bikes or in the same vicinity. That's typically where our mindset would start. Right. And then what we do is scale up demand. I mean, we see this as very seasonal, that there, there will likely be a, more of a demand in Memorial Day and, and through the summer than there will be in November. But what we could do is start at the locations uh, similar to the bike share, identify zones that we want to start, and then track this on a daily and a weekly basis. So there's going to be a potential for us to realize some areas need more scooters on certain days. Maybe on the weekends, certain areas will be more used than on Monday or Tuesday morning. So we have that ability because we're picking them up on a daily basis and placing them each morning. Uh, we can have that dialogue of where our data suggests that they should go, combined with where you know the local community thinks that they should be placed. And they're not locked up. No. So they are to speak. not. No, okay. they don't have inter a locks in them. Right. So, okay. All right. I have a couple of questions. When I was too. out, I'm, are you, you still going? Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. I still have a few I'm more. sorry. It's okay. Uh, and then last, so 62% of people think it's a great idea, or whatever that statistic was, but they're uh, like 40% ish don't. What What were their top three problems with it? Jones. Uh, I think, like I said, the I see the, the chaos on, on the sidewalks okay. um, in terms of if they're not geofenced and they, you don't create the parking stations, then a lot of other cities have operated it where you could park them anywhere, and we wouldn't want to go to that, right. that approach. Um, that's a big one. Riding on the sidewalks is, is another one, um, especially when they first launched. Um, one of the first places they launched was San Francisco, and there was a lot of... Uh, it was just excitement and like no one had ever seen these anywhere in the country before so people were kind of just riding them all over the place um, and not theft uh, not that I know of okay some random acts of vandalism which is unfortunate for any mode of, of we see it in our bike share um, but I think one in addition to what Mike talked about um, some cities have faced challenges when there's there's tons of different vendors you've got different scooter companies telling the public different things telling the city different things imagine you're you know, say transportation manager, and you've got an event that you want no scooters at or all scooters at, and you have multiple companies to contact, um, that created a bunch of challenges. So a city like Austin has 15 different scooter companies, very different approach than some other companies or some other cities that have taken a proactive partnership approach. Uh, it's a lot easier to control what you want when there's a more limited number of, um, you know, vendors in the, in the market. Okay. One question, how about a helmet? Is that gonna be required? Uh, that I have a to use it. No, the state law um, under 18, you wouldn't have to, you're not, you're not required to wear a helmet. Over, over 18. I'm sorry, over 18, not required. <laughs> under 18, required. So when I was in Los Angeles last week, they had, there were three companies who had scooters right in on the block where I was. And they just kind of leave them anywhere on the sidewalk. So these will be for daytime use. There's no lights on these. Is that correct? That's a good question. Um, I'll have to confirm our model. Typically at their daytime, um, there are some markets where we leave them out through dust. So I imagine that they're, they're light activated, but let me get back to you on a specific model. But they um, do have lights on the, on, the, on the unit itself, right? Yeah, on the, on the scooter. Yeah. On the scooter itself. So yeah. there is light, so you could use them pretty much day or night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In most cities that we bring this to, we'll agree some sort of hard stop, 9 p.m. typically. I mean, they are, they are most commonly used for like daytime. Gotcha. Use, and that helps prevent the again the random acts of vandalism yeah well uh, they were pretty popular when i was just there last week everybody yeah. had a scooter and they all stayed in the bike lanes yeah yeah 
and then they could kind of leave them anywhere. They didn't have specific corrals for them. Mm -hmm. They were just kind of just randomly on the sidewalks. Yeah, what's what's great, uh, particularly in LA, um, you know, where some of those companies got their start is that it's made drivers more aware. When you have more people in different types of vehicles, you, they're in bikes, they're in they're in scooters, they're on different vehicles. There's electric skateboards now, right? Yeah. There's so many of these vehicles. Uh, the cohesion of, of all these different folks that are on these different uh, you know, vehicles have made drivers and pedestrians just more aware of, of who's going where and drive a little bit slower and um, you know, watch out for but, each other. Yeah. yeah. So you would be able to shut it off at night, like let's say after nine o'clock. If we decided we didn't you want scooters, have the ability we could to shut it up. But, okay. Yeah, we control right, each scooter. So we actually, you know, they don't have a physical lock, but but they do have the ability for us to lock them down. So someone can't just walk up and ride it. Uh, we actually have them take a picture of their ID uh, when they start the ride. They take a picture of how they parked the scooter when they end the ride. So there's a concept just like your Uber rating. If you have a negative uh, parking uh, rating, we can remove you from the platform and we could share that data with you. Um, but those are those are some ways that we help control uh, the types of behavior that we want. We had to nail down our benches on Sunset Bridge because people threw them in the water. So I'm, I'm just curious that you don't that people don't do that with these things. But hey, yay! I mean, we've had bike share here for two years, and yes, they do have locks on them. But any time that they're taken out, they could have ended up in a lake, and they haven't. So. Oh. Knock on wood. Because <laughs> we clean those lakes out. <laughs> we have to go on RFP for this thread? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is a presentation by the city planner, Michelle Alonzo, regarding the 301 8th Avenue Condominium Association retaining wall request. Council members, I'm going to be brief because this is actually a report back from the last meeting. Last meeting, I presented at 301 8th Avenue Condominium Association wanted to build a retaining wall in the right of way. Uh, I went back to them after this council meeting and suggested that they not go in the right of way because it's only a matter of 2.5 feet and that they build a retaining wall on their property. They, Their representative came back to me, said they still would like to proceed with an application in the right of way. I then went to the tax assessor and got valuation based on seven dollars a square foot that the evaluation of that area is two thousand five hundred and twenty dollars <coughs> i reported back to them um, and they would like to go forward so tonight i'm just reporting back to you that they do not wish to abandon this application okay thank okay you, Michelle. all right thank you thank you and just it's not on tonight's agenda and everything, but I'm for them going back to an AFP. Okay, thank you. Review of agendas, uh, this evening's agenda. Thank you. Uh, resolution 2019 133 is the special event applications. Uh, 134 is rescinding the special event application. Uh, Mr. Boyd had spoken about that previously. 2019-135 is accepting a donation from Andrew K. Now company and company for the Asbury Park Fire Department for a training dummy. Um, is there any questions on the consent agenda? Moving on to individual resolutions. Resolution 2019-136 is the payment of bills. Um, resolutions 137, 138, and 139 are IP purchases. Um, Special attention should be brought to 139. SDL software um, is what the staff is recommending. This software will bridge the gap between um, planning, the planning department, the building department, and code department, and aspects of public works. Um, right now, between those four departments, there's five or six different software. Uh, so no one can talk to each other. This will move everything into one <coughs> application. Uh, resolution 140 is for additional access security systems throughout the city, throughout the city hall. Uh, this is the security locked doors. 
141 is for a bucket truck. Um, don't get confused by the articulating telescope aerial device. It's a bucket truck. Uh, 142 and 143 appoint the engineer PNM and the special projects engineer ARH associate. Uh, that is through the fair and open process. And resolution 2019-144 is accepting the results of a bid for thirteen twenty two for thirty five thousand dollars. Thirteen, I'm sorry, thirteen twenty two Springwood Avenue. Um, this was out to bid uh, for the last month or so. Uh, we previously discussed it. Meetings. Is there any questions on individual resolutions? Public. Yeah. Yes. Se seven o'clock. The questions from us. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Moving on to introduction of ordinances. Ordinance for introduction tonight, 2019-15. Um, as you recall, the last or two council meetings ago, staff requested that the council vote down the $15 million for the boardwalk improvements. The reason why is because we're going to be able to save the down payment assistance if we look at this as a larger project. Um, so working with bond council and financial staff and the financial advisor. Um, if we include the $15 million for the boardwalk, along with the Green Acres application of $4 million, which we got the million dollar grant, under the, the local bond law, the Green Acres grant removes us from having to do the down payment assistance. That down payment assistance would be about $750,000. Um, so by doing it as a larger, looking at this as a holistic North End quote unquote project, um, it will save us seven hundred fifty thousand dollars in the beach utility budget. Um, again, as we've been discussing, we're, we're still ongoing negotiations with ISTAR, with both the Boardwalk and Bradley Cove, but this will put the funding mechanism in the right place and saves us three quarters of a million dollars in the process. Uh, moving on to introduction for 2019-16. Um, this is the short-term rental improvements, uh, short-term rental uh, Recommended changes from staff and from Council Deputy Mayor Quinn and Councilwoman Clayton, who've been involved in this. Um, as you'll recall, we took public comment uh, for about a month. We went through the comments, went through with some staff changes, and the introdu introduction of the ordinance includes two major changes allowing a second bedroom and changing the documentation that is permitted um, because it was very narrow in scope before, but allow for different documentation. Uh, moving on to 2019-17, the hotel room occupancy tax. This is a two-part aspect of a change. One, uh, Mr. Fred Fredo and myself had worked on some of the cleanup language uh, to bring our ordinance up to code, but also under the state law, short-term rentals can be taxed at the same rate as um, hotels, motels. So this actually will enable um, the city to collect that revenue as per the existing state statute. It's, it mirrors the state statute. Under the state law that authorized this, enabled it, um, there is a 90 day wait period. So this will get through the summer season um, because the second reading in 90 days with the Treasury, uh, we anticipate this to go into effect sometime in September or October. Um, but it is collected the same way as hotel motel taxes. Um, we have nothing to do, we just get money committed to us. And ordinance 2019-18 is various changes to the parking ordinance with Mr. Gonzalo to give a, a brief update on um, if he wants to. Again, <laughs> uh, so 2019-18 adds a number of streets to the alternate side parking regulations, which has been requested by residents, was vetted by the parking committee and quality of life committee. It also adds some time limited parking to the blocks between Memorial Drive and Main Street, uh, which was requested by businesses uh, on those streets. And it increases the penalty for parking uh, in a permit only area from $30 to $50 without a permit. Michael, how are people made aware of these changes? Uh, when, when we actually adopt it, we're gonna be putting together a press release obviously all of our usual city channels and we can send letters out okay we'll send letters out to all residents all residents on the affected Great. streets and is there a grace period between the signs go up and actually start yeah we we usually have a grace period of about a month and for a second reading public hearing tonight is 2019-13 it's a capital ordinance from 
uh, capital surplus for $65,000 for the acquisition of RBCs or sewer treatment plant. As previously discussed, these are the things that actually clean the, the waste. Um, and as discussed last meeting, we're looking to upgrade these every you know, year or so. Um, so this is for second reading time. Are there any questions on the agenda items? Thank you. Nothing. Thank you. Matters by City Council. Okay, so it looks like we've got a busy weekend. Um, on Saturday, April 13th, there is um, Clean Ocean Action is doing a beach sweep from 9 to 12.30, rain or shine. Um, people are gathering at either Convention Hall or Fisherman's Lot. Um, they need volunteers of all ages. And when you're finished with that, you can come on over to Sunset Lake because we've got to clean up from 10 to noon and we're going to get some of those bicycles out of that lake. <laughs> um, on April 21st is the um, annual Easter parade at one o'clock on the boardwalk near uh, the Paramount Theater. And um, the third Thursday now of every month, there's going to be a poetry crawl downtown. It's being organized uh, by the Merchants Guild downtown, and this will be every third Thursday of every month beginning April 18th. Uh, April's National Poetry Month. This is a great time to start it. And uh, I think that's it for me. Saturday, April 13th, uh, Made in Mammoth at Mammoth University. This is when Everybody has an opportunity that products that are made in Monmouth County can be produced and sold when they're at Monmouth University. And one of the advantages is that our group of kids, KYDS, are also there. They're young entrepreneurs and they're selling their products. So it's an opportunity for us to support them. And the hours are from 10 to 4. Also tomorrow, April 11th, between 10 and 11, you can come and have coffee with one of your councilwomen at America's Two. Cup. Two of your councilwomen. Two of your councilwomen <laughs> um, at America's Cup. And it's going to be Eileen and myself. So please come out and get a chance to know us, and we will try to we're talk down. to you about whatever's going on in the city. And we're buying the coffee. And you don't have to pay for the coffee. Um, on Friday, April 12th, you get an opportunity to walk the boardwalk with the mayor. It's a wellness walk on the Asbury Park boardwalk if the weather is nice. And it's going to be between 1 and 2, and you're meeting at Asbury Avenue and the boardwalk. The definition of nice is 80 and sunny. <laughs> <laughs> on Saturday, April the 13th, <laughs> this, we, have, we will be having free coffee. <laughs> at the Kuna Cafe and it give you a chance to meet our police officers so we encourage you to step out it's from 9 a.m. to 12 o'clock one of the one of the biggest activity that's close to my heart is May 11th uh, even though artistic month is this year is this month but we um, the recreation committee decided to have it afterwards because we're so uh, involved in so many other things and we're looking for volunteers to come out and help out. We appreciate your input. You get in touch with Alicia, myself, or Esther, or Sylvia back there. It's gonna be a great event. It's barbecue for artistic kids. Thank you, or special needs kids. Thank you. Um, so uh, I just wanted to um, thank um, Sonia, who put together this week's entire government week. So we had tours of, of City Hall. With yeah. ev We're working on tours of every single elementary school. We had to space them out so it's not all going to be government week. And she organized the touching a fire truck, coffee with councilwomen. Um, so every day this week, there is um, interaction between the city government and the public. So uh, kudos to you, Sonia. Okay, as we said at the beginning of the meeting, tomorrow night at uh, Jumping Brook is the dinner for Habitat for Humanity, so great event. Uh, Saturday night is at Deal Golf Club, uh, the dinner for the Rotary Club, 100 year. Tickets still available, great event. 
and a great free event where they give away money is Sunday from 7 a.m. to noon. The Asbury Park Fishing Club is having their annual carp contest. Uh, it's to get the carp out of Deal Lake, which do no good to Deal Lake, and there's cash prizes for largest, most, and there's children's categories also. It's always a great event and it helps the lake immensely. So anybody would like to go fishing and try to have a license, have a license, yeah. Uh, try to win the money, please help us get the carp out of the lake. That's all I have, thank you. Matters by the city manager? Uh, there's there's one this evening. Uh, last week we, we received bids for Deal Lake Drive's repaving and uh, storm and sat sanitary sewer reconstruction. Uh, the bids came in at approximately $100,000 higher than the estimate. Mm -hmm. um, and the estimate from the DOT to the actual bid specifications was to finish DLA Drive to order of the city. So we're going to be coming back at the next meeting asking to increase that bond ordinance by about two hundred thousand dollars to cover case any change orders, and subsequently we'll ask for a reduction in some other ordinance so that we keep our net debt the same. That's all. Okay, I have a question for that. We were hoping the price was going to come in lower, obviously, and we were hoping that we could do the block of Emory between Deal Lake Drive and Eighth. So obviously, if it came in higher, we're not. So is there going to be enough money? By adding this money to do that one little block, which is worse than Deal Lake Drive. I believe so. I'll double check the J. <coughs> the unit prices for the milling. Okay, it's a, it's a very small block. I think Jay's here. He was supposed to be here. He might be outside. Okay, it's whatever. Here. I don't have to know now. Thank you. Matters by the city attorney. No matters at this time. This time we'll recess until seven p.m. Five minutes. The order, please. <laughs> Oh, she was back there. <laughs> Councilmember Chapman? Here. Councilmember Clayton? Here. Councilmember Kendall? Here. Deputy Mayor Quinn? Here. Mayor Moore? Here. Please rise for a silent prayer moment of reflection, please. Flag salute, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As to comply with the Open Public Meetings Act, Chapter 231, Public Law 1975, Adequate notice of this meeting has been provided in the following manner. The annual notice was forwarded to the Asbury Park Press, the Coaster, and the Sir Ledger on January 2nd, 2019, and posted on the bulletin board the same date. All notices are on file with the city clerk. This time, can I have a motion to open a meeting to the public, please? Move it. Second. All in favor? Aye. When you come up to the mic, please state your name and address for the record, please, and each member of the public has three minutes to speak. Ernest Bignoli, 400 Deal Lake Drive, <coughs> apartment 5D, Asbury Park, New Jersey. Uh, there's a ongoing mold mildew in City Hall. I've been reporting it to the city manager and departments. If you go in the main lobby, the police lobby, up in the offices, there's falling ceilings, water intrusion, mold, mildew, people are breathing it in. The carpets, they keep replacing them because they get moldy and mildew. Uh, down by Convention Hall, there's still ongoing trip hazards. The boardwalk is a insurance risk. I don't know how many lawsuits there's been, but I mean, that thing is just a, that's why there's signs up there, trip hazard, be careful. I've never seen that in the United States before. Uh, falling debris off the pavilions, I kept, Try. Look, who's got a comment? Falling debris off the pavilions with people sitting under there. One of them collapsed on a on a bench that's still there, and it broke that heavy wood thing. And then finally, they decided to go and put some uh, paper tape around. Uh, at least now there's a fence up. But I was reporting it for over a year, and they just disregard everything. 
because my emails and my documentation goes into a very special holding place with the city manager. And he says, oh, I, I work on it. I've never gotten one response in 2,000 emails with documentation where the city manager is confiscating them. So for him to make statements in public meetings while I'm handling it is, is a falsehood. And it's also generated, I've had enough, so I've, now I've generated a notice of claim. In case anyone doesn't know what that is, that's what you have to do with a city before you file a lawsuit. And this city is very familiar with lawsuits. Maybe the public should be aware how many people are suing the city, how many city employees are suing the city, how many city employees have sued the city, how many residents are suing the city, and it's like a litigation nightmare here. And the taxpayer has to pay all the settlements. Uh, 19,000 US cities, Asbury was rated 45th at the bottom, the worst. Schools, bottom 4%, dangerous, and school board members send their kids out of town. It's, it's really hard what's going on there. Uh, city litigations everywhere. Uh, I work in my own news press and independent, and I'm being, uh, I would say, harassed by local press and the city, not giving access <coughs> like everyone else to the press. For example, the press carried that tirade that the city manager accused me of borderline crimes. You, if you can finish your sentence. <laughs> you can finish your sentence. You tell me to go to Long Branch, right? No, then you're going to go to Long Branch. <laughs> That's where I'm headed. Uh, and they, they carried every single degrading comment that the city manager made on APTV that went out into newspapers and the coast <coughs> printed it word for word, saying that I'm sending borderline criminal emails, that I'm making fun of city employees. You're here when you talk about me, the things they say about Okay, me. your, your sentence is finished, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, have a <coughs> drive care. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Dwayne Small, 1304 Madison Avenue. I wasn't going to come here tonight. I was on my way home. And I just happened to see the police have some people on Lake Avenue, right off of Lake and Elizabeth. So I stopped, go around the corner, park on Ridge Avenue, go see what's going on. I'm talking to them. The girl tell me they pulled over because she threw a bottle in, in the street. I said, well, you know they could have locked you up. And I was telling her, you can't be talking like that. So now as I'm walking, I get to the corner of Lake and Ridge, I see a van with a bunch of Hispanics in it. They drinking, they got New York tags. So I see the police on the corner. I say, yo, get them. They drinking. He ain't do nothing. I go get in my truck. I pull off, they get behind me. He come, I pull over. What you pull me over for? Give me your lights, I'll let you know. He said he pulled me over because I failed to use my way to pull away from the curb. How many people in here do that? Huh? So basically, this wasn't nothing but harassment. Now, John, you see what I mean when I be sending you these pictures of police stops and what's going on? And it's only happening to black people. This ain't happening to nobody else. You can't go over there and see them police got people against the wall, detaining them, and if you don't give them their name, they giving you a ticket. If you go to our municipal court here, look who in there paying these fines. Poor black people. And then this guy who pulled me over, Parisi, he got a young officer with him. So what type of message is he sending to this young officer, John? And why is this keep happening with these police? What's wrong? When is somebody gonna get in trouble? You know, we hear all of this. When Salerno was here, he did this and this, got rid of bad police, but it was stuff that was done against the department. What about what's done to the public? Ain't nobody getting in trouble for that. And we all know, and I, like I said in my emails, if you look at what happened to people, Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, this is all precipitated by these little petty crimes. Oh, you trespassing. Oh, you jaywalking. Oh, you this, you panhandling. Next thing you know, somebody dead. So John, what are we waiting for? Are we gonna keep letting these police do this? You know the young boys getting tired of them, right? I heard on Sunday they had a little rally over there, peace rally. They said the police was over there messing with them brothers like it wasn't nothing. 
If you don't, if a black person don't get a police they name, they getting a disorderly conduct charge. But in the state of New Jersey, it says that a police just can't walk up on you and demand your ID. So John, all of these pictures that I'm sending you, it's just an accumulation. That man just said it. A notice of claim. We already had somebody come down here and file something against y'all. You probably already got it. A $2 million lawsuit because of one of your police officers. John, you need to do something, man. This all speaks to leadership. If leadership not correct, then those in the field ain't gonna be correct. John, please do something for this town. Catch on fire, man. Thank you, Dwayne. And listen, I'm going to turn fast with this. And it's on his body camera when he said, do I have a problem with yelling in the street? Do I need police assistance? So that's why he pulled me. Thank I'm going to pay. I'm going to pay. Don't have no problem. I'm going to pay. Thank but you. But the thing is this, you know, you need to do something, man. Why you got the opportunity? It's tough to follow, Dwayne. Uh, Robert Wiener, 601 Madison. Uh, first of all, thank you to Councilperson Chapman for promoting our third Thursday. It's been in the works a long, long time. And uh, Sylvia, Sylvia was the guiding force to bring us all together to create this. Oh, oh well, she did. But it doesn't just happen. It's, this is replacing uh, First Saturday, which was, in, she inherited First Saturday. It's been First Saturday for 10 years, but we don't need business on Saturday. We don't need to bring extra people in on Saturday. We're crowded enough. So this uh, ongoing program, it's called, it is called Third Thursday. Uh, Matt, who works with Sylvia, created a beautiful logo, and you'll see signs and promotions about Third Thursday. It's not only uh, gonna be poetry, it's every month it'll be a different event. This month, it's a poetry call, a non-alcoholic poetry call. It'll involve five businesses. We have a dozen poets. Uh, Michael Mills, who everybody knows from kids, is bringing four of his poets. We have published poets who are coming down here just to speak to us. Look for, uh, a map and information on where these are being held and who's going to be attending them. And please support us. This is the first time we're doing something like this. So we're a little skittish about how many people are going to show up. But uh, it's something interesting. It's clean. Uh, it's important for the downtown. So uh, that's it. So thank you very much. Thank you. So we will speak now. Thank you. Uh, Sylvia Sylvia, uh, Chamber Director. Um, Bob gives me too much credit. Um, we are a support system for the merchant community, um, so thank you for that. Um, uh, we're really excited about the Third Thursday initiative. Um, we like to say Thursday is the new Friday. Um, I think that bringing in more consumers and more awareness of Asbury Park um, at times when it maybe isn't as challenging to find parking and when our when our businesses can use a little bit more of a boost is probably um, an initiative that would be very helpful. Uh, so thank you for that and thank you guys for including us in on it. Um, a couple of other things, uh, just to let you be aware, I'm not sure if you know this, uh, the chamber, we added a jobs posting and listing uh, tab on our website. It's free for anybody to use. If you have a job to post, you can just submit it up there. We approve it on the back end. If you're looking for a job, please go look there. We've got probably about a dozen that are up there so far. We have um, restaurant, retail, service, and other as tabs. So we thought that, you know, for a beginning was, um, would include everything that might be offered around uh, Asbury Park. Uh, and Lastly, we have our uh, Carousel Awards coming up. Um, I, if, I don't know if, you, if you'd seen the um, invitations that went out, but uh, that is where the Chamber acknowledges businesses and people in the community who have uh, given a little extra to Asbury Park. So just to announce our um, honorees this year, the President's Award is going to Lynn Kirchdoffer, who is the founder of the Asbury Ushers. 
Um, the Visionary Award is going to Russell Lewis, who is the owner of the Watermark. The nonprofit of the year is the Asbury Park Music Foundation. That's a new category for us. Um, entrepreneurial Excellence is Kimmy Massey over at Confections of a Rockstar. The Kenneth T. Roth uh, Landmark Business Award is going to Vic Sood, who is the owner of Home Drugs. Um, the public servant this year is Senator Vingo Powell. Uh, the Joan Flatley Spirit of Asbury Park Award is going to Tom Hayes of New Jersey Natural Gas and Town Square Media, who is 94.3 The Point and 101.5 for the Boardwalk Radio Station broadcast. Uh, it's May 10th, 6 o'clock till 10 o'clock at Convention Hall. We really hope that everybody will join us um, and we'll have something exciting coming up about a big unveiling of our new award that has been created by a local artist and it's going to be the brand of the Asbury Park Chamber Carousel Awards going forward. Oh, on target. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, honorable members of the chamber. My name is Bill Macklin. I am a new re newbie resident. Uh, I attended that very exciting meeting in February regarding the uh, pool project, the Ice Star project. And I have a couple of questions about that. I'm wondering if uh, you, the um, honorable council members have reached some kind of conclusion, sense of council, uh, position on the matter. And uh, if they have, I wonder uh, when it's going to be uh, announced or provided for the public. And if you haven't, uh, uh, I'm wondering why there hasn't been some action if, if there hasn't been to this particular point. Uh, I think uh, we're, uh, the entire town, as I recall that meeting, seems uh, very interested in the results. And I hope you take some time and explain your rationale, whatever it is, because I anticipate you're going to be faced with that issue and that those agreements that were made a number of years ago are going to be faced with issues in the near future over and over again. Uh, and uh, I'm wondering if um, this project continues, and I hope it doesn't, but that's up to you. Uh, Will you provide or will you request or require that the developer provide a 3D model of what's actually going to be there instead of some of those uh, single dimensional pictures which tend to give very limited uh, perspective on what's actually being proposed, size, what it looks like from different points of view. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, are you done? Are, are you finished? Yes, sir. Okay, just a quick uh, answer to your questions about the pool club. I believe it was two meetings ago, the mayor and council voted to pass it to the planning board. So it has been passed by the mayor and council to the planning board. They have not applied for an application. Or they have not submitted plans yet for the planning board to review it. Uh, I will let the planning board know that the public wants to know at the planning board meeting will they have 3d you know uh models so that i can't tell i can't tell you i can't force them to but i'll let the uh, barbara krasak the chairperson of the planning board that it be known that it was asked well, thank you very much for the answer uh, uh, mr <coughs> mayor um one suggestion uh, you might provide that kind of information to the public because I would anticipate there's a considerable amount of, of interest in this. Yeah, it, it was posted. Everybody was aware of it. People attended and were able to talk about it that night. So there was full transparency that was on the agenda and was going to be voted on. I, I'm not indicating there wasn't. Okay, but okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Hello, I'm Kathleen Muma, 1501 Ocean. Um, I was wanting to comment about the ordinance um, on tonight's agenda, 2019-15, <coughs> the $19 million uh, bond issuance. So it appears to be, to me, to be a beach utility bond. So it draws on beach badge revenues um, and also uh, Green Acres funding. So. Um, 
looking forward to hearing more about it. But at first glance, I think this is a major positive step forward towards preserving open space and public access um, on Asbury's northern waterfront. And I, uh, I hope that you all vote yes on this ordinance. I can't, I can't think of a better use of beach badge revenues than land conservation. This is a um, uh, a forward-looking decision that you've made um, if you're going to pass it. And I think that if you're using beach badge revenues to uh, conserve land towards land conservation, you're setting a precedent for coastal communities across New Jersey. So um, I applaud this being on the agenda. I look forward to hearing more about it. I have some questions. Uh, my questions are, what is the amount of the Green Acres funding? Um, in section two, it says that the principal amount cannot exceed 19 million pursuant to local bond law. I wonder what that means by local bond law. Um, my third question, do you have an anticipation yet of how much the phase five infrastructure project will cost? And lastly, uh, formally, the Originally, the RAB bonds were said were set up to pay for the infrastructure improvements, Phase Five infrastructure, um, and I wonder what's the status of that. Is is there a possibility of like a, a split of the RAB bond and a, and the beach, <coughs> beach utility bond, or do the RAB bonds go away or get used for something else? Three is easy. No. Four is easy, it's a possibility. And one or two, I'll let Michael answer. <laughs> a million dollars in Green Acres. And the section, the cost, it's up to 19. So it could be 4 million, 12 million. That's like a municipal law that you can't issue more than $19 million? No, that's what we're looking at. The, the way it's broken down is, as you know, we canceled the $15 million previously. Under local bond law, you need to have 5% of a local match for down payment, unless you have a grant in kind. So if you read the bond model states and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So if we kept the $15 million, and if you remember we did that earlier in the year in case we had to push forward, mm -hmm. by combining the projects, we don't have to do the 5%, that saves us about 750,000. So we put this all together um, so that it saves us three quarters of a million dollars in the beach utility budget. Uh, concerning the RAB, probably, I think that one wasn't answered by the mayor. Um, and yes, the RAP can be used to pay for open space. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Polly Shilga, 1100 Fifth Avenue. Um, I'm a, a founding member of uh, Asbury Park Complete Streets Coalition and also a member of Save Asbury's Waterfront. I have a few announcements, but I wanted to just say um, thank you all. Thank you, City Council uh, and Mayor, for your forward thinking and openness to the moving forward of hopefully saving this beautiful piece of waterfront that we have that may be facing development. We, uh, Asbury Park Complete Streets Coalition, even though most of what we do is concerning streets moving around in the city, on city streets, part of the, mo probably most of what we do is about equity, about, about people fairly and safely being able to get around in the city part of the city and part of the one thoroughfare of the city is the boardwalk. The oceanfront is part of that. And Save Asbury's Waterfront is also about equity. So we've kind of merged the two groups together, um, Save Asbury's Waterfront and uh, Asbury Park Complete Streets Coalition. So I would urge you, those of you who have are not on social media, sorry, but those who are, if you can check us out on Asbury Park Complete Streets Coalition on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, and tons of information on our website, asburyparkcompletestreets.org, and also the Save Asbury's, uh, the North Beach of Asbury Park on Facebook. Um, as far as announcements tonight, I, I wanna also make sure that everyone knows about on May 4th, um, the Asbury Park Alive event, the Open Streets event, which is going to really bring the city together from the Southwest Quadrant, to the northeast, so diagonally, a swath through the city, car free, uh, kind of like a giant block party. Mike Manzella is part of that group, really spearheading it with some other volunteers. And it really should be an amazing occasion. Just open streets, no cars, bikes, walking, walking dogs, pets, activities, um, art, poetry, spoken word, music. Um, so that's on the agenda. I hope you'll make a note of that on your calendars. Also, on a positive note, our police department's getting a 
a bad rap for some things that are probably legit. I want to say thank you, though, because we have been having a wonderful interaction with the police department regarding uh, installing, distributing and installing bike lights. We just had a, a really successful campaign and a fundraiser and the community stepped up. We had door prizes. We made over $500 to purchase bike lights and the police department has agreed to help work with us to distribute and install bike lights. So people getting lit up at night is really important. People who use bikes to get around who don't have cars. So um, we're going to be setting something up on the city streets to, to do this. and. Um, that's upcoming. Guy, Guy Thompson, the captain, just agreed to help out, and he referred us to Mike Casey. And um, there's also Coffee with the Cop, which Jesse mentioned. We're going to be giving out and distributing and installing bike lights at that event as well, with the help of the police department. So, so they're in, in the effort to connect the police with the public in a positive way and supportive way. I think that's everything. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Joe Coakley, uh, 315 8th Avenue, and I'm the Legislative Director for Surfrider Jersey Shore. I want to uh, speak just briefly about the article in the coaster the other day about the beach ballet service that ISTAR is planning um, with this new oceanfront hotel. Uh, Surfrider has some concerns about it. Uh, my, first, my, my first question for the council is, how much does the council know about it? Were they briefed on it before this press release went out? Um, you know, is there is there a specific plan in place? Will these bellhops have to have beach badges as they cross back and forth in the boardwalk? It, are they going to bring in the hotel's chairs or is it the guest chairs? Are we going to create a de facto private beach in front of this hotel because of, because of this, where they're bringing in um, chairs and umbrellas and stuff from the hotel? This is all stuff that's deeply concerning to Surfrider and. Uh, you know, the access to the to the beach. So I'd, I'd like to see what the uh, thoughts and comments of the council are on this. Okay, as far as did we know about it before reading it in the newspaper, same as you? Absolutely not. Uh, do we have a meeting scheduled towards the end of the month with ISTAR to talk about other things, including this? Yes. Okay. Uh, is there going to be a private beach? Absolutely not. ISTAR has never asked for one, and if they did ask, the answer would be no. And then, like I said, it's not, not a private beach, but a de facto private beach. If you're putting the, the answer to that, out, the, the answer to that is we read what you read. Okay. We don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> we're, 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 going to, we're going to have that meeting, but right now the answer is no. Sir, um, and please feel free to reach out to Surfrider if you want if you want our input on anything that goes on in the meeting. We'd be happy to uh, to help out. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, I'll start it when I you start, start it. Okay. Hi, I'm Diana Patet, 321 Sunset Avenue, also a surf rider, events, and ocean friendly restaurants. Uh, one, a word of thanks, and then an announcement. So, um, yeah, thank you to the council for doing all that you've been doing to um, preserve beach access, to keeping our coastal, um, our coast resilient, and uh, to be looking into this issue about the the possibility of this um, illusion of a private beach club with what's going on with the beach valet service and also your creative thinking in trying to preserve Bradley Cove which is something that the chapter of Surf Rider has been working on for 10 years we don't know what we're going to do next if we do preserve this <laughs> land so thank well, you we'll have a lot more time <laughs> yes a lot more time so but thank you very much uh, we look forward to seeing what's going to happen with that and then the announcement um, next Saturday April 20th Surf Rider is having an Earth Day celebration on the roof of the beer garden. There's going to be earth friendly vendors, live music, various uh, environmental organizations talking about their work. If you all have some stinky old wetsuits, you can bring them for recycling. Um, there's also going to be kids' activities based around um, environmental awareness. And there's also going to be a Wesley Lake beach cleanup that goes from 9 to 12 and then the celebrations on the roof go from 12 to 6 p.m. and all proceeds go to benefit surf rider and our actions to protect our ocean beaches and waves especially here so thank you oh and thank you too to the deputy mayor and council Movin Chapman for coming to speak at the event as well so thank, thank you. you thank you and a lot of people don't know Diana Diana goes to every event be it uh, if we're the lead speaker, if Pallone's the lead speaker, if Booker's the lead speaker, it's it's a pleasure to go to an event and see her be a Nasby Park resident there, being so supportive. So th thank you so very much. Good evening, Maureen Nevin, DLA Court. Um, 
I I agree that you know this this is good to um, to get this this uh, settlement I guess this but I, I need to ask the uh, the numbers on this this ordinance um, because the, the dollar amounts don't seem to add up you know when we talk about the the 15 million that was going to be paid for the say just the boardwalk alone um, and now this is going to be 19 million instead of the 15 million so if it's still paying for the boardwalk how can we possibly pay for the it says property rights and development and stuff um, I don't know what I'm missing there um, question about a land use attorney who was advising us on the land use law involved in, in this ordinance. Um, could you give me the name of that council? Um, it feels funny asking these questions and not getting an answer, but I realize we're going to do that later. Okay, there's section 10, um, which I had uh, a lot of questions about. Maybe um, someone could explain section 10 when we're finished. Um, okay, also, <clears throat> we state here that um, the value of this of these improvements uh, are estimated to have a 19-year life, right? Um, could we put a, a life on the debt? How long is that debt expected to, um, to, to be worked down? What's the time on that? And um, the $950,000 it's mentioned in D, um, is, that, is that for the uh, bond fee, the uh, council fee for the bond attorney? And also, I just wanted to be sure that everyone understood what ad valorem means. Um, if that bond should not be paid as expected, by the revenues. Ad valorem means, and you can correct me on this Fred, if, if I'm wrong, that means that the, um, the bondholders can go directly uh, to the city and the city will have to impose a tax directly on the, as we said here, um, unlimited obligations of the city, um, taxable, all taxable property within the city. That's all of us. And it's, um, sorry, there's no limitation as to the rate, the interest rate, or the amount. <laughs> okay, well, some of your questions, and this is the introduction. So two weeks from now, when we have it, we'll have all the answers there, and you can stand up there and talk for 30 minutes, three hours. So it's not three minutes. Some of the information is impossible to give you. Again, I think it was an outstanding job by the administration or bond council to look at this and say, wait a second, we're, we're listening to the public and we want to do it right. And the 15 million was a starting place and that was a good starting place, but that did not address other issues. So the maximum that can be spent is $19 million. And by going to $19 million, as Michael said, it saves a $750,000 one-time hit out of beach surplus, which might have led us not to be able to do this without a tax increase. So I think between the administration and the bond council coming up with like increasing the amount, increasing the green acres, putting that in there, they did a fantastic job and they also increased the other things that it could be used for. And again, right now, we do not know, again, the numbers are being drawn up as far as what the board work's gonna cost. We don't know what that number is going to be. We do not know if I star is going to pay for it. So we have to have this in mind. So as far as who the, who was the council, Michael? Bond council. It was, it was Cantalupo. Okay, it's, it's John Cantalupo. Grier, Grier Law Firm. No, I, I asked for the land use attorney, not the bond attorney. It's land. Not land use, it's bond. Sorry? It's not land use, this is financial. Well, there are land use issues in the, uh, the application of the funds, no? No, this is land use in the section, uh, the 950,000 you're talking about, which is commonly referred to the 220 costs. No, I, mean, I didn't ask, you I asked didn't what ask the 950 that. 950 was for. I asked if it was the bond attorney's fees. It's paid, it's any professionals, bond attorneys, 
engineering, um, redevelopment council if needed. It, because as part of the Green Acres application, we have to do various surveys, appraisers, appraisals. This actually covers those costs. So it's mm -hmm. an estimated cost. Mm -hmm. Under the, the local bond law, this is called a soft cost. You can take a soft cost and use it for infrastructure for a hard cost. Mm -hmm. Soft can go hard, hard cost can't go soft. So this, by going higher in this amount, and you'll see all our ordinances go high, it allows us some, some leeway to spend on the actual infrastructure. So for this 950 that you're, you're seeing, it's gonna pay for the surveys, it's gonna pay for the appraisals, it's gonna pay for the bond council, the advertising that has to go in the newspaper. Right. That's what that's for, and then section B, which is the 19.21 useful life years, that's how long it's paid back. That's actually in the local bond law. Certain things have certain That is time. the payback. Yes, over 19.21 years. So it'll be 19 years. So if you look at the bond law, like a road is 10 years, uh, a highway might be 40 years, a municipal building might be 40 years. Mm -hmm. It's just how you break that down. And by doing it this way, it actually increased the years so that the payment would actually be less. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And Maureen, you may know that uh, the mayor and council recently appointed a new waterfront redevelopment council, Joseph Marazzini of the firm of Marazzini and Falcone, uh, who replaced McManaman in Scotland. And uh, Joseph Marazzini has been working with our bond council, John Cantalupo of Archer Griner, regarding matters concerning the waterfront. And is that on land use issues? Is that what you're saying? Well, on redevelopment matters generally involving the waterfront, which may include land use. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to say thank you for you the work state that you your name and address okay, for the record, sorry, please. Sorry, I always forget. Carrie Butch, uh, 500 Deer Lake Drive. Um, I also want to say thank you for the work that you've been doing on North Beach Preservation. And I wanted to offer um, that I love Joe Marziti. I don't know who, who wouldn't. So I, I like that. Um, I guess I have, have a couple questions. One is on the name of the appraising. Do we have the a name of the appraisal company? And can we get the appraisals? Can we say them? For Bradley Cook. Finish all your questions. Here. Okay, go through them. Okay, I have two two minutes. Um, have we considered eminent domain? Have you used an environmental engineer to to go ahead and um, take a look at that pros that area in the in the North Beach, and also understand? You know, I've been around for a while, so I saw eminent domain used taken people's homes and businesses. So why wouldn't we want to use that tool for the public good in this situation? And I hope you consider extending that process to the pool club area and, and maintaining a public park in that area that would be available to everybody. So those are my only comments. And you know, I do know that there's additional money not just Green Acres funding, there's natural resources damaging money, not damages money. There's also, Monmouth County has been trying to give, you know, off, often tries to give money for parks in Asbury Park because of the, you know, many reasons, okay? But um, think of, think of that. So what do you think? Yeah, I was gonna wait till the end. So, uh, until everyone spoke. I, I just wanna be really crystal clear. Uh, the bond ordinance that, that is being voted on tonight can be used to acquire development rights or what is the land known as Bradley Cove. But that appraisal process is absolutely not finished. We don't have a number on that. So do, don't get the impression this 4 million is gonna buy us back Bradley Cove because it, I think we have an amazing appraiser, one of the top in New Jersey. What's the name? She must really Jeff know. Ottawa. Jeffrey Otto from Otto. the Otto Group. Okay. Yeah. So that so that's working its way through the system. There's there's two different issues. Uh, Green Acres requires a, a tremendous amount of information, and uh, for lack of a better word. 
Oh, I guess my point too, and Carrie, we can talk about this after. I'm not going to go too far in depth. The appraisal process is working its way through the system. The, this money can be used to preserve Bradley Cove. I'm going to go out on a limb and say we're probably going to need more money, but but I'm not going to say anything until we get an appraisal that comes back. And when an appraisal comes back, I don't I don't know why it wouldn't be public. Um, and as for eminent domain, I know we had conversations about eminent domain in the past. I don't think we've had one recently. I would love to hear Marziti's take on it. The last take I got was Scotland's. So, you know, we can absolutely put that on the agenda and find out what they think about, you know, eminent domaining um, the area known as Bradley Cove or, or larger. Uh, we haven't had Marziti's take on the eminent domain question. And we would still need an appraisal. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have to pay fair market value, but it is something that council could, could consider if amicable negotiations do not prove fruitful. We've had our initial meeting for the appraisal uh, with our appraisers and with iStore's appraisers. One of the reasons we um, picked this appraiser is because he is one of the, the top ones in New Jersey um, and is a Green Acres approved appraiser and did that just for us. Um, so that first meeting went well and those two appraisers are gonna get in a room and, and fight it out. And I truly, and I wouldn't say this lightly, have tremendous faith in the city's appraiser. Okay, and the I appreciate appraiser working it. for iStar is a gentleman by the name of Ted Lemicella. And once the city's appraisal is prepared, it would certainly be an open public document. Well, I appreciate all the work that you guys are doing. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, um, you know, attend the Land Trust Rally with Kathleen on Friday. That's happening in New Brunswick. Maybe, maybe we can find some more money. Thank you. Tracy Rogers, Sewell Avenue. Uh, first, I want to thank the council for that ambitious move uh, to use this money for land pres preservation. Uh, South Brunswick, a uh, town I, I raised my kids in, uh, spent a lot of money each year getting a lot of Green Acres money. So uh, to do this, I think it's outside the box and a great job. Uh, so I just want to commend you guys for, for, for thinking for thinking outside the box and, and trying to look at other things. Uh, one other question, uh, February 25th, we had the agreement on the affordable housing. And I think it was on the agenda for March 13th and it didn't show up for the uh, planning board, which is the next step to come to you guys. I uh, just want to know, uh, when the administration will get back to the planning board so that can be pushed to you guys for approval. And also, um, I, I read an article in 2013 from Mousey Park Press that talked about um, a lot of the, uh, the issue that's coming up on the taxes for the school and saw that 57% uh, of the pilot program that was presented uh, went to the city, 38% went to the infrastructure, 5% went to the county. So uh, with a $2 million shortfall in the school tax revenue, what are we looking at coming into this tax space to close the year out? And any suggestions as to what our thought process is gonna be on that? We have met with the Board of Education uh, we know the new bill S2, I think it's a terrible bill. Uh, the Board of Education has not publicly come out against it for whatever reason. We've met with them. They have uh, a tough, they have a dilemma in front of them. It's not a one year dilemma, it's a five to six year dilemma where they're losing $27 million. As far as past pilots, uh, which we told them, and it's public knowledge, uh, the majority of the pilots given out by the city of Asbury Park were well before this council, and none have been given out since S2 has passed. That's not to say we won't give out ones in the future, but again, it's state law. Be it the Board of Education budget is 10 million or 100 million. We have to pay for it. And all we do is collect the money through taxes. So whatever their tax rate is, we collect and we send them the money. What they do with it, that's their, game so we don't know what the budget is going to look like but we will fund it 100 percent as we have to by state law the affordable housing plan 
Oh, okay. The affordable housing plan was adopted by the planning board on uh, Monday. Monday. The next steps, it doesn't come back to us. It's now adopted. Uh, we have put together an RFP for a consultant uh, to do the inclusionary zoning, which we talked about in February. So now they just, I haven't even received the final version of it yet from the board. So hopefully I get that tomorrow and start working on the RFP process. Great. Hi, uh, Rita Morano, 8th Avenue. Uh, about the $19 million bond issue, and it includes uh, Bradley Cove. That's like a, a mysterious thing. Nobody has a lot and block number. Nobody knows what it's appraised at. I mean, it's kind of like fake. It's like fake news. And <laughs> I, I don't know why we're so worried about it, but it see, I, I guess uh, Michael explained the uh, part of the uh, $19 million, and we'll have to go with it. Are we going to put back the boardwalk? The, the, what, the part that's finish, taken up? Finish everything, Rita. Huh? Finish everything. All right, finish everything. Okay, uh, the other thing, uh, Michael, I want to thank you for answering my email. And it's, supposedly it's going to be resolved tomorrow hopefully after a year and i just want to tell you about city hall how taxpayers feel when they call when they call and get a machine it's not very nice we know we have a million secretaries in the building and you call these departments and you don't get an answer and then they don't even call back <coughs> i mean like this there's, there's etiquette they should call back i have called the office that you know I'm talking about for three weeks in a row. I mean, that shouldn't be. Should I have to do all that? I'm not getting paid. I think the city employees need a lecture about who's getting paid. I mean, we don't work for them. They work for us and they're getting paid. It's not right that uh, we have to go through this all the time. And it, it, they, what they do is when they don't answer, then they have neighbors fighting with each other, which is wrong. You have to get along. I know that. But if you don't correct this situation where people have to answer the phone, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen here. It, you're going to streamline this place. I mean, people have to be accountable, and they're not. And I, I don't know, do you have a manual, an employee's manual? I, the, huh? are you, I don't want to want you to Okay, start. that's it. I mean, I just want to tell you, I mean, uh, I thank you for answering my email and it's going to be resolved, I hopefully, tomorrow. But, I mean, like, if taxpayers, call, everybody complains about that. Everybody that you talk to, whether we're on the same side or not, but in that, we we're in total agreement. Nobody answers the phone. So, it would be good if you could correct that, I hope. There's there's three administrative assistants in this entire building. So when you say there's a million secretaries, there's three across 10 departments. Um, I know what department you're talking about. Half that, the staff was in, in on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, which was a problem. Um, there actually is a standing order that all phone calls should be re returned within 24 hours. Um, as you remember, when I started, one of the things that we had issues with was customer service um, because people weren't getting the phone calls back. So early in 16, there was a couple staff meetings where we said, call everyone back within 24 hours. Your situation is wrong. It should have been handled better. I apologize for that. Thank you for complimenting me on getting back to you. Uh, that department's being a little short staffed right now. There's been some illnesses um, and some training sessions, but yes, that will be addressed and fixed. I know what you're talking about. You're not wrong. I just want to compliment Cindy's department because I always get what I want from that department. And somebody always answers the phone. Yay, Cindy! What are the departments with the administrative system? Thank you, Rita. <laughs> Hello, uh, Warner Baumgartner, uh, Library Board President. I'm going to give thanks today to. Uh, Mayor Moore and our city manager. I think the public should know that uh, 
late last year, uh, a meeting was put together between the library and uh, city representatives in order to forge uh, a more productive relationship with uh, using staff resources to help the library out. So I think the uh, public should know that Public Works has been helping out the library. Uh, their IT department has been helping the library immensely. We're on the road to uh, upgrading ourselves uh, technologically uh, very, very rapidly with uh, new computers and new wiring, new switches, um, just really upgrading the library, the building and grounds, and the IT capability. And the city deserves thanks for that. So I thought I'd uh, thank you publicly as uh, a representative of the library board. Secondly, I'd like to change hats. <laughs> Asbury Park, uh, city historian. Um, this talk about Bradley Cove, um, I thought would benefit from a little background. There really is no such thing as Bradley Cove, as people have realized. What it is, is it's part of a roadbed, a public right of way, and part public property. The original redevelopment plan from the 80s did not include these parcels. They were part of a bankruptcy settlement in 2002, where Joseph Carabetta settled an action with the city, and Asbury Partners was given more rights than were originally envisioned in the redevelopment plan. Now, as far as numbers go, just to put things in context, Asbury Partners purchased the entire redevelopment package for about $21 million. That's all of Mr. Carabetta's property, all the development rights, the convention hall, the Paramount Theater, the casino building, the heating plant, the carousel building, and was also given all the rights to all the vacated streets and public properties on the boardwalk, all for $21 million. I thought the perspective of that might aid you in your negotiations. Um, as far as current state of affairs, there's a simple solution to this. If the Bradley Cove redevelopment rights or project are valued at, say, $12 million, all you need to do is give additional height to the proposed tower, which is right adjacent to that site by Deal Lake. There's already a preliminary site plan approval. I understand that the penthouse of the new hotel going up in the middle of town there is $6 million for an asking price. So two penthouses at an upper level on the tower on the triangle would certainly be a trade-off for the development rights of the Bradley Cove at no cost to the city. Just give them additional height or density and be done with it. Uh, that's my suggestion, and I hope the numbers uh, kind of pique your interest. Thank you. Thank you. Felicia Simmons, Sewell Avenue, Asbury Park. <clears throat> I'm gonna change up a little bit. Um, I just came back from a really um, inspiring conference in um, New York City last week and um, inspiring and also um, horrifying in some points. Um, talking about, we talked about affordable housing, but we we're talking about African-American and brown um, value in the upcoming future. Um, and it's projected by the year 2035 that brown and black dollars will equity will be at zero because we are technologically um, behind in an educational system. As of being part of a uh, former board member of the Board of Education in Asbury Park and also a local advocate, I am reaching out to the city um, and some of the initiatives that are coming in the future, like Asbury Park Tech, Tech World that is coming to the city and also adjacent to Neptune. Um, in the future with free Cisco training. But I'm applying to the city as saying that you need to come up with, we need to partner together to come up with some initiatives to make sure that no one's left behind in this divide. After listening to last week, every presidential candidate in person talk about the future, um, I was saddened to know that the future of most of the people in this town are gonna be um, tossed. 
Um, I love open space. I, I, I love that for the future, but also want to make sure that our children and our young people and my generation are provided for in um, upcoming generations. And I think we need to be addressed. I know we had the employment plan and we had other educational plans um, through the Board of Education, but I'm looking to be more progressive in that unity for the city because we will be left behind and we we won't we need home ownership we need affordable housing we need great education and we need safe streets and all of those things work together to make a um, great community so as this information will be coming to you I'll be sending you different initiatives to make um, that we can partner on together but um again i'm i'm hopeful but also um fearful of the future and um i'm looking to you as city council to work together to make sure that we have a plan for the future thank you that's it motion to close okay. thank you please all right we'll move on that, to let me just say before we move on uh not. felicia i agree with you and when we met with the board of education you know, we just got off transitional aid, so it's not like we're rumps and we got $20 million in the back. It's not like we're Lakewood that just got 15, it's a Republican city and got $15 million from a Democratic administration. We told the Board of Education point blank, whenever they want to go someplace, we will be there with them protesting S2 and say it's not fair to Asbury Park. So when they want the city there on their behalf, joining with them, that we can do. But as far as loaning them $15 million, we don't have it. Thank you. Okay, okay. We're on the same page, but go ahead. All right, we'll move on to minutes. We have three sets of minutes this evening executive session minutes, workshop minutes, and regular minutes, all of March 27, 2019. Have a motion to approve, please. Move it. Second. Councilmember Chapman? Yes. Councilmember Clayton? Yes. Councilmember Kendall? Yes. Deputy Mayor Quinn? Thank you. Yes. Mayor Moore? Yes. Move on to the consent agenda. Resolution 2019-133, resolution approving special event applications. Resolution 2019-134, resolution re rescinding a special event application. We have resolution 2019-135, resolution accepting donations from Andrew K. No and Company for Asbury Park Fire Department. Is there any items that anybody wishes to have removed from the consent agenda? Nope. Seeing none, can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Second. Councilmember Chapman? Yes. Councilmember Clayton? Yes. Councilmember Kendall? Yes. Deputy Mayor Quinn? Yes. Mayor Moore? Yes. We're on to individual resolutions. We have resolution 2019-36. Resolution approving the payment of bills. Can I have a motion to approve, please? Move it. Second. Comments or questions? Councilmember Chapman? Yes. Councilmember Clayton? Yes. Councilmember Kendall? Yes. Deputy Mayor Quinn? Yes. Mayor Moore? No. Resolution 2019 137. Resolution authorizing the purchase of various IT equipment. Can I have a motion, please? Move it. Second. Any comments or questions? Councilmember Chapman? Yes. Councilmember Clayton? Yes. Councilmember Kendall? Yes. Deputy Mayor Quinn? Yes. Mayor Moore? Yes. Resolution 2019-138, authorizing the purchase of IT equipment for the police department. Can I have a motion, please? Move it. Second. Comments or questions? Councilmember Chapman? Yes. Councilmember Clayton? Yes. Councilmember Kendall? Yes. Deputy Mayor Quinn? Yes. Mayor Moore? Yes. Resolution 2019-139, authorizing the purchase of SDL software for various departments. Can I have a motion, please? Move it. Second. Comments or questions? Councilmember Chapman? Yes. Councilmember Clayton? Yes. Councilmember Kendall? Yes. Deputy Mayor Quinn? Yes. Mayor Moore? Yes. Resolution 2018-140, resolution authorizing the purchase of additional access control security system. Can I have a motion, please? Move it. Second. Second. Comments or questions? Councilmember Chapman? Yes. Councilmember Clayton? Yes. Councilmember Kendall? Yes. Deputy Mayor Quinn? Yes. Mayor Moore? Yes. Resolution 2019-141, resolution authorizing the purchase of articulating telescopic aerial device, which is a bucket truck. Can I have a motion, please? <laughs> Move it. Second. <laughs> Comments or questions? 
Council Member Chapman. Yes. Council Member Clayton. Yes. Council Member Kendall. Yes. Deputy Mayor Quinn. Yes. Mayor Moore. Yes. Resolution 2019-142 authorizing the execution of an agreement for professional engineering services with TM Associates. Can I have a motion, please? Move it. Second. Comments or questions? Councilmember Chapman? Yes. Councilmember Clayton? Yes. Councilmember Kendall? Yes. Deputy Mayor Quinn? Yes. Mayor Moore? Yes. Resolution 2019-143 authorizing the execution of agreement for professional engineering services with ARH Associates. Can I have a motion, please? Move it. Second. Comments or questions? Councilmember Chapman? Yes. Councilmember Clayton? Yes. Councilmember Kendall? Yes. Deputy Mayor Quinn? Yes. Mayor Moore? Yes. Resolution 2019-144 resolution accepting bid for the sale of certain property which is no longer needed for public use. Block 903, lots 1.01, .01, which is 1322 Springwood Avenue. Can I have a motion, please? Move it. Second. Comments or questions? Councilmember Chapman? Yes. Councilmember Clayton? Yes. Councilmember Kendall? Yes. Deputy Mayor Quinn? Yes. Mayor Moore? Yes. Move on to ordinances introduction. Ordinance 2019-15 by an ordinance providing for various North End Beach utility improvements by and in the city of Asbury Park in the county of Monmouth State, New Jersey, appropriating $19 million, therefore including New Jersey Green Acres Program Grant Loan, and authorizing the issuance of $19 million bonds or notes of the city to finance a part of the cost thereof. Can I have a motion to introduce this ordinance, please? Move to introduce. Councilmember Chapman. Yes. Councilmember Clayton. Yes. Councilmember Kendall. Yes. Deputy Mayor Quinn. Yes. Mayor Moore. Yes. Public hearing for this ordinance is scheduled for May 8, 2019. Ordinance 2019-16, an ordinance amending and supplementing Article 13, 1300, <coughs> entitled Short-Term Rentals, as contained within Part 2 Rental Properties of Chapter 13, Property Improvements and Neighborhood Preservation, Property Maintenance Code of the Code of the City of Asbury Park, New Jersey. Can I have a motion to introduce, please? Move it. Second. Councilmember Chapman? Yes. Councilmember Clayton? Yes. Councilmember Kendall? Yes. Deputy Mayor Quinn? Yes. Mayor Moore? Yes. Public hearing is scheduled for May 8, 2019. Ordinance 2019-17. An ordinance amending and supplementing Section 10-2, currently entitled Hotel Room, to hotel room Occupancy Tax, of Chapter 10, Finance and Taxation of the Code of the City of Asbury Park, New Jersey. Can I have a motion to introduce this ordinance, please? Move it. Second. Second. Council Member Chapman? Yes. Council Member Clayton? Yes. Council Member Kendall? Yes. Deputy Mayor Quinn? Yes. Mayor Moore? Yes. Public hearing is scheduled for May 8, 2019. Ordinance 2019-18, Ordinance of the City of Asbury Park, amending and supplementing Chapter 7 of the Code of the, Asbury, of the City of Asbury Park regarding Traffic and parking regulations. Can I have a motion, please? Move it. Second. Councilmember Chapman? Yes. Councilmember Clayton? Yes. Councilmember Kendall? Yes. Deputy Mayor Quinn? Yes. Mayor Moore? Yes. Public hearing is scheduled for May 8, 2019. Second reading public hearing, Ordinance 2019 13, a capital, improved, a capital ordinance appropriating the sum of $65,000 for the acquisition of rotating biocontractors for the sewage treatment plant. I have a motion to open this ordinance to the public, please. Move it. Second. Second. Read a question. You have to get up to the microphone. Um, I don't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a sewer plant. Sewer plant. The sewer plant. Yeah. This is re to replace parts that are failing to make it work correctly. Five hundred dollars is for the advertising costs. Oh, okay. Motion to close. Move it. Second. Second. Have a motion to adopt ordinance two thousand nineteen dash thirteen. Move it. Second. Councilmember Chapman. Yes. Councilmember Clayton. Yes. Councilmember Kendall. Yes. Deputy Mayor Quinn. Yes. Mayor Moore. Yes. There being no further business, have a motion to adjourn, please. Move it. Second. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye.